I think um, maybe let's start so long. Um, just a note. Uh, I might be developing a migraine, which impairs my speech. <laughs> so if I start talking about it, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> bye bye, thank you. Um, so, if I start to not make sense while I speak, um, I'll just hand it to the Andrea and she'll just end up the job. Okay, so. I'm sorry about this, it hasn't happened in quite some time, but you know, kind of feel like it really does. So, okay, um, welcome to the first class of the research methodology, PGDD uh, 513. Um, you remember that we introduced it in the introduction, introduction session. Now each time I'm going to stumble over, over a word, everybody's going to go, oh, there it comes. <laughs> okay. Um, so the session outline, we're going to take a look at the class times, like yesterday, just some administrative issues. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about the assessments. Um, then I'd like to introduce you to the FIO project, just in reference it's made to it, uh, and I'll tell you why we're going to specifically look at that project in this module. Um, and then uh, we can start with... Uh, study unit one, okay, for today. <clears throat> so in terms of the administrative issue, uh, uh, issues, um, we have class here each Thursday um, from 9 until half past 11 in this venue. Um, just make a note or just check for week five. It's a Monday and a Friday um, classes. For, for yesterday's classes, it will be on a Monday and today it will be on a Friday. So just note that. If you have to make additional arrangements, it should be here, so just on your feet for that. Um, so then, also like yesterday, uh, the timetable we have loaded on your, uh, onto your fundi, you have access to it there. Um, this is, like I said yesterday, the one that we all use in terms of our reference, uh, frame of reference. So if something changes, it will change on there and you will also notify the guys, okay? Um, you can find that there's a folder named General Information and Administration. You can find that within that folder on your phone. Um, just quickly tell me that there was one or two problems logging into a phone. Lefa, did you manage? Um, <coughs> did you guys manage to log in fine and everything? Good news is you are now on, on our class lists on your phone, so you should have access to all of the modules. 
Then the other thing is uh, we also sent you your ACDS uh, email addresses that you received that. Okay, so everybody's up and running regarding that. The only thing I'm not sure of, but I think I, I just neglected to remind you about it, is the link to the <coughs> Google box on yesterday's subject page. Okay, so we'll still deal with that, and that will be there before next week. Okay, so in this class, what we've worked in um, to the schedule uh, is workshops. There's two of them, the 17th of April and the 22nd of May. Now, for that specific class, we don't have a presentation or something that represents the two The idea with this is that it will be, it's, it's quite um, conveniently uh, placed within the timetable. So, um, as soon as you guys are busy with your assignments, there will, at some stage, for examination preparation, there will, at some stage, be a workshop session. In that session, me, myself, and myself, myself and Andrea and uh, Derek, Mr. Derek Weta will also will all be present for that session. Um, and this is purely to help and assist you guys with the security technology and the things that you need to know and be capable of at the end of the semester. Okay? So that's something we built in. We found and we all experienced in our studies that research methodology was quite a difficult thing um, to master. Um, and once we got to our postgrad studies, that was something that was totally expected um, of us uh, to understand and just actually apply. So in this subject, um, this is one of the things that we would want to assist with, the difficulties of research methodology, okay? And see that um, to some extent we can divert or we can assist with that. Okay. So your study material, I don't know, have anybody um, gone to fetch the book? Uh, your study material is the four set out the textbook. Um, we will work mainly from this book. Um, however, there are other prescribed uh, or uh, compu compulsory um, reading that you can also find in your study guide. Now, in terms of that, some of the reading uh, we are not putting on it fully because it's, for example, books and we found some nice stuff in other books regarding research methodology. So, what we are doing in the process of uh, is reserving those materials for you guys at the library. However, uh, me and Leanne just had a conversation before. Uh, I think that it, it, might, it might be quite difficult for um, students that are not on campus to actually access those reserve materials all the time. So I'm still thinking of ways that we could actually make that available to you electronically. Either uh, getting that from the library reserve online uh, or us getting that on the phone. But, but we'll, we'll see how we can actually arrange it. So it's easy to get to the material. And you don't have to run into the library all the time. Uh, it's actually quite nice. There's a very nice lady working with the library assisting with this. So it would be quite nice if it wasn't that some of the students cannot be on campus all the time. Um, OK. Then there's, in your study guides, there's uh, additional reading as well. Go through that. Um, I think it was for people that said yesterday that if you um, if you are wise in your studies, you look at that, all of that as compulsory reading. So go through that as well. However, that will not necessarily be made available to you guys each time um, you are um, expected to go and do research for that on your own. Okay, so go look up those type of things on your own. Um, it's a different button to that. Okay, so let me just do this. In terms of the structure of this uh, course uh, regarding assessments, um, we thought, well, I'm going to start with the last point, the idea and structure of, of this module. So in, in developing this and looking at the difficult, difficulties that us, us ourselves have in our modules, um, we thought of how we could actually improve that. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. Okay, fingers crossed. Um, so, what we were thinking about this module 
uh, is that we'd like, you know you guys have the research methodology this semester and then you have the research project in the second <coughs> So the idea that we have with these two uh, subjects in the, in, two, in the both semesters is that um, you start off with the research methodology this semester and you continue through, so create kind of a, a process, a year process regarding uh, the specific subject. So the idea is that you look at if you do um, the research proposal in the first semester. You're expected to do this whenever you do your research and in the research proposal that it's um, okay for our commission and then you can continue with your research. So we'd like to do the research proposal in the first semester and then in the second semester um, you're going to be expected to write the research report. Okay? So, what we'd like to do is keep that the same topic and theme throughout the year. Does that make sense? So you don't necessarily have to now start with a new idea when you start in the second semester. Okay, so that's the idea regarding that. What we further thought is that being, uh, the, being uh, the, the subject in the postgraduate diploma, we'd like to actually teach you guys the skills and, and skill set that you need to write a proposal and a research report and not necessarily focus too much on the, the concrete specific. It's important, you can have to read, you can have to write a literature review and all those kind of things. But when when you go through it, we're not gonna say, well you use different authors and you should have here. Okay, so that we're not gonna look at that per se. We want to look at the research principles that you apply to these topics. So that's the main idea behind the subject. So once you start with doing this, um, unfortunately you cannot do this without actually applying it. So, but, but that's the main idea behind this. So what we want to do is we want to divide you guys into groups of four to five. And you are going to work as a group on your research proposal and then on your research proposal. Okay, so the same group will go from semester one to semester two as well. Also important um, regarding that, is that you're not going to pick your own groups. So we will allocate it to a specific group. And this is planning to ensure that the um, distribution is correct. But just to make sure that there's different disciplines in the group that have different perspectives, so it's a nice mix of that. Um, that uh, Suna, um, this is Suna Mayer at the office is busy doing, so that will probably be ready by next by the next class. So we will already be saying. Um, what we did discuss is actually allowing you guys to pick the topics. Because I think to some extent in, in such a module, module that we're doing this year, um, you know, being given uh, the topics and those types of things, it's to some extent nice to actually just be able to choose what you want to do in this group as well. We want to allow some different Okay, so in terms of the assessments, there's, there's three types of assessments or three assessments. Um, assessment one, will be assign, uh, an assignment um, counting 40% of your participation mark. Um, you hear me clearly? 40% of your participation mark, not your module mark. Okay. So that will count 40% of your participation mark. Then assessment two will also be an assignment that will also count 40% of your participation mark. Um, and at the end, we are uh, also bringing in a class participation type thing. Okay, so we're going to look at class participation in terms of group discussions that we, ha we have in class as well, um, as well as your participation within the groups doing the assignments too, okay, because that's important. Remember in the introduction session, you guys complained and said, yeah, but the biggest challenges you have had in terms of group work is, um, you know, somebody's not carrying their weight, somebody that's all of the... the um, um, the headings and they just um, run with them, and etc. Cetera, and cetera. Okay. So in this way, remember that you are going to be peer reviewed, um, uh, peer reviews, in terms of your participation in the group as well. Um, I don't think I, I did, when we went through the Google Docs thing uh, with the introduction session, <coughs> did, it, uh, did John show you guys how you can actually see new growth and at what time? 
Okay, so that is how we will, as, as lecturers, assess that thing as well, as well as the, the, the discussion. So at the end of the day, like in all of the other modules, um, and like I explained yesterday, uh, your participation mark will count 50% of your module mark at the end of the day. Um, and then your examination mark will also count 50%. Okay. Um, we don't necessarily want to remove um, the examination and the assignments and everything you do too far from one another throughout the year. We want, in other words, we don't want to catch you out in the examination. You will, you will have a pretty good idea of where you stand regarding research methodology throughout, throughout the, the, the first semester as well. Okay. So then, um, your more information on your variations and assessments um, is in your study guide as well. Remember the 40% uh, subminimum, so that's important. You have to have a 40% subminimum for your participation mark at the right exam and also for your examination to pass it. Okay. Any questions regarding this? Okay. Now, okay, let me, let me just quickly uh, talk about why I'm going to talk about it now. Um, you've heard about the project that we are currently busy with for the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization for the Year. So we are quite deep with our noses in the dark account and starting to analyze it and so on. So. Now, given the time um, period that we have in this year, it's very hard uh, doing a proposal, setting up uh, research uh, questions, developing either a questionnaire or a practical uh, question sheet, um, going out to do field research, coming back to you, working with that data, and actually then ensuring uh, that you finish on time with the report. You can see how that's a bit. Um, just give me an indication who has done this type of research proposal, due to analysis, stuff like that. So you guys, you guys can understand that in a year it's quite it's quite limited time um, that we have. So, when we started talking about how we're going to do this module, um, that's one of the things that was one of our biggest concerns. Um, also, when you go out and do your research, how do we ensure that you um, collect enough data to actually analyze and write something up? So, in that way, we, we are fortunately busy with the FR project. Okay? Um, so what we'd like to do then, <coughs> um, so what we'd like to do there is make what we are doing with the FIO project available to you guys to work on for your recent uh, project and your proposal and so on. Okay, so in terms of that, um, I just quickly want to give a quick introduction about what this project is about. Um, and what are we looking at within this project? Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with the UN agencies, the FIO is the UN agency um, working on food and agriculture, or the, the UN's food and agricultural organization. Okay, so they are agency of the UN focused um, on internationally leading efforts to defeat hunger. We focus specifically on those issues and all of the issues relating to that. So, you can see to some extent disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction also falls within this, this scope of it. Um, they also work at doing research and building the knowledge base regarding these issues. So, what they are currently, or what they are also doing, is they also do research that they make available to other practitioners or um, farmers or uh, anybody that needs an, an insight in terms of agriculture and food security. Okay? So they're trying to build the base uh, of knowledge regarding that as well. And then also, um, they're trying to assist in improving agriculture, forestry and fishery techniques um, and practices to ensure good nutrition and food security in countries. Okay. So they do that in the so-called development, uh, develop and um, developing. Um, then, on their website, they set their goals as being to eradicate hunger, um, to eradicate food insecurity and malnutrition, 
um, and the elimination of poverty and, the, uh, and driving forward of economic and social progress for all. He said it's a big scope, man. So look, they look at a wide range of issues. Um, they also want to do this with the focus on sustainable development um, and util utilizing uh, natural resources, including land, water, air, climate, and um, genetic resources for the benefit of present and future generations. So that, that's that whole sustainable develop uh, development issue that they also work into their goal at the end of the day. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the research project about? What was the mandate of this to ask to do research on? Um, the project's title is Measuring the Contribution of Disaster Risk Reduction Interventions in Agriculture and Food Security to Resilience in Southern Africa. Okay? So, what they were trying to do is um, identify certain disaster risk reduction techniques that they themselves have been involved in. Um, and they asked us to look at how do they contribute to resilience um, in the general sense. Okay? So FAO has developed intensive work uh, in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in Southern Africa since 2010. So they've been working on this. So I'll focus on 2010. Okay. Um, they are also supported by several donors in, this, um, in these initiatives, um, like the European Commission and OFTA, which I think falls under USAID. Um, and the various, in, uh, various interventions piloting different technical activities have been developed in collaboration with a lot of um, partners, obviously, and have led to improved knowledge of good practices and their impact on rural community resilience. Okay. So what they, what they asked from us was that they had identified five key technical areas, which we will discuss now and go through as well, um, to be structured into five separate research projects. So these different key technical uh, key technical areas, um, they <coughs> asked us to look at and see how they actually contribute to small-scale farmer activities um, and resilience in that regard. Okay. Um, so where are we now currently in terms of this project? Um, research uh, was done in um, and data gathered in Malawi, in Mozambique, and Madagascar. Okay. More or less 1,100 uh, questionnaire responses were, um, were gathered. So that's quite a big part. You can see it's quite a lot of responses and there's a lot of information regarding that. Um, qualitative and quantitative methods were also used, so there are focus groups that were held, um, and also questionnaires that went out. Um, and now, like I said, we are very much <coughs> So, what does this mean in terms um, of your projects and what you are going to be looking at? Um, with 1,100 responses, there's a lot of data to be touched with. So, firstly, the time is too limited. We're not going to send you into the field to do field research and come back. Okay? So, um, first of all, you have access now to the data. Um, because of the limited, limited time and something and, and those things, um, we thought that this would be a good solution. Then um, it's also uh, something that contributes and builds on the second semester activities. Okay? So the research report that you have to provide. Does that make sense? Okay, so here are the, the five technical key areas that we are looking at currently. Now, remember that in the, um, in the research that we are doing currently, we're focusing on resilience and how these different things contribute to resilience, okay? Um, I'm going to be honest and say it's a difficult, it's a difficult <coughs> um, task to actually do. So what we wanted to do is, is to some extent, maybe um, simplify it a bit more uh, for your research reports. And therefore, uh, our main focus for you guys will be on how does the different activities or um, organizations, because we work with that as well, uh, contribute to disaster risk reduction. So, like I said before, this is mainly um, a vehicle for us to have you implement what we're doing in class government. Okay? 
but you're going to have to do reading on, on these different things and you're going to have to show you know, argument and research questions and those sort of things. One main thing that I want to highlight is we don't want you guys to think that after this you will have to go into agriculture now or something like that because it's very agriculture back and very agriculture and <coughs> Um, like I said, it's just a vehicle. Okay. So, and also, the focus um, of disaster risk reduction is a good uh, is a good topic for you guys to kind of investigate and see how different things contribute to this. Um, you are challenges uh, throughout the process, and, but that's part of the process as well. Okay, so the different um, themes that we want you guys to work on as groups. Um, is that of the role of small-scale irrigation systems in increasing household food security. So that's the first one. Um, the role of farmer associations in contributing to disaster risk reduction. Um, this is more of a, of a focus on, on uh, <coughs> social structure and social networks and how that contributes within the farming community and to disaster risk reduction. Um, and then the role of appropriate crop varieties to reduce crop expo exposure. Um, the promotion of good cropping techniques to mitigate the impact. That should be natural hazard, sorry guys. I missed, I missed the natural hazard or the hazard. Um, and then the fifth one is timing of production in hazard prone areas to prevent losses um, at peak risk periods. <coughs> so you can see that, that a lot of the terminology and the as uh, uh, concept that we are in general dealing with with regard to disaster risk reduction and management and um, like we spoke about yesterday comes into play when you look at these processes and techniques that are actually so a huge part of this would actually be to describe disaster risk reduction and how it functions and what's involved in that and then bringing in the different themes that you guys are going to focus on okay um there's something else that i wanted to say about this Oh, what's cool about this is each of, uh, we, we are also divided into teams in, within our center, researching this specific stuff. So what would be cool is that you guys will have a topic that you are practicing on, and choose a topic that you are practicing on, and there will be a specific research report leader that also is focusing on the same thing. So that would really work well in terms of questions, you know, struggling, struggling with something, looking at different reading, and so like that. So, that's also an, an advantage for you guys in this process. So we are also working on this, these topics too. Um, okay, the themes and the group numbers we'll, we'll allocate, um, I think, in the next session when we have the groups, then we will allow you guys to choose the topics. Um, but things are not what, you know, for the time being, what you guys would be interested in doing. And then you have to find it out in the group. You see, you see if the members of the group also get the same thing. Okay, so, um, but yeah. Okay, before I get to this conversation that I want to open with us, uh, or include the guys in that moment. Um, remember I was talking about, um, in the introduction session, I was talking about how research methodology and research allows you to kind of experience, um, um, investigate the things around you in the environment that that intrigue you and that kind of raise questions with you. Unfortunately, and this is a, this is um, I don't want to say bad news because it's going to be a, a, in a bit, an adventure anywhere you go. But unfortunately for this year, um, we will not be focusing on things specifically because you guys can't. We, will, we cannot be doing in this year to think of a question and actually come up with something to decide how you're going to approach it. However, um, to some extent that's why we want to pick one of you guys picking the, the topics of those five as well. That you got that to some extent you have the freedom to say, well I'm more interested in this side like you that's rather than that. So that's that's the bad news in a sense. And um, you know but like I said, the, the aim of this model is actually just to, to give you a whole set of skills that you can now apply. So when you move over to master's level, if you do, that you now have a framework within what, within um, how to question something. Um, 
Any questions regarding the things that I've just gone through? No um, inquiry about how difficult you find the job. Um, what I'd like to do now, there's a few guys that indicated that they have been involved in research um, projects. I actually wanted to make a video um, of different researchers. I, I know a lot of people that really have a passion for research and they enjoy uh, doing research and finding things out about something. So I actually wanted to make some, just a box pop video kind of just for them to say why they actually love research so much. I must learn to tell you, but I did some, I did talk to some people Verbally and um, a lot of the things that were raised were it, it gives structure to what I want to question. Um, it gives a framework within what I can describe something. Um, and in that way, I'm able to actually have a question and research and actually present the politics. Um, I think it was actually personal to that. <clears throat> to me personally, I'm a very important person. I like wishing things and I like wondering about the inside. <coughs> and to me, it also it allows me to be visible. And it also gives a framework. So what I want to do now is um, those of you that have been <coughs> involved in research, um just give us an indication what why you love the process and why you like the process. What was the what is the main challenges that you find? Okay. Like that research 
I said, but my, my view of research is that you say it's a you know, I'm going to my stats and oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. It is, it is my point that you can do the area on. And we'll, we'll handle um, both of the designs. Um, they have specific methods. Um, and I think you'll be quite more interested in the uh, quantitative design. Yeah, that I'll be So, so and also, um, you know, I think you'll enjoy looking at when you can, when you can use which one and how. Okay. And then I skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pick another question. <laughs> Not really a big one. That's what I tell my husband I'm going now. It can be boring. To <laughs> yeah. it's not a it should have been quite fun. Um, that's good because um, you know I also had a, a similar kind of view, not necessarily in terms of of fun, but I just didn't really understand quite the value that it can add to different things. You'll we'll, we'll make a specific note of that because the value that quantitative um, data can add, the quantitative methods can add to qualitative. Something, which is really nice. But okay, we'll, we'll discuss that later on the ground, but specifically on the different designs. Anybody else? relating to the amount of time that it should go. So one of the main aspects when we start looking at what questions we should ask is we don't have space. We don't have space to ask too many questions on each side, on each, on each topic. And that was quite frustrating as well. Because at the end of it, what happened is um, I'm specifically looking at the second, uh, second research project with the Farmers Association. We want to even have space to include everything that I want to do. So now what I have to do, which is also not fun, is I have to now go to Leanne with her, her um, research uh, report or her data for her um, piece that she has to do. And I now have to see how I can actually use some of the answers that they gave to her report to, uh, um, to explain and to describe the things in my report, which is, which is fun. That took a lot to do in the background. Interrelating um, and actually sharing things in the room, which works quite well. Um, any other one, any other person would like to share with you? Yes? Um, that have days of the month or days of 
examples that you have to give the amount of guys in a month that something happens. And since we uh, were looking at the response of 400. So that's an inaccurate but you say the questionnaire is still in wrong. You have that discretion to try to keep on doing that response. The words are also known as a process. Based on the fact around you why did that happen. Um, and really focusing <coughs> on a topic regarding that and actually it's not exposing but um, investigating what are the causes of these things. It's also a critical process depending on what you do. So um, <coughs> what we'll do and it's part of uh, study unit one, I think we'll only get to the next session, um, is we'll also take a look at ethical considerations when we're doing research. And in that we look at at all of the different things from uh, plagiarism down to uh, what do you do with respondents and how do you work with them and what's the thing to do. I know the psychology class would know that you go through you, you you such a critical process regarding ethics in your research. If you're not just allowed to work in the way. Yeah, I don't want to do it. Exactly. It's, it is, and with us it's a process specifically with our master students as well. You, you have to go through what they want to do so carefully and see to what extent that actually touches on the questions. Because there's lots of things that, that um, influence that as well. Um, any other challenges and loves or um, positive things that you, that you experience from research specifically? And Tabu? Practitioners working with problems in areas 
the lighting is also very small, and can be very subtle. It's specifically that as well. Um, that you can constantly keep an open mind that you are nothing. You, are, you don't know anything you are involved in yourself. And that the people that you are talking to actually also have a lot of information that you can apply to unique situations and things that you are coming to. bombarded with researchers looking at different things within that area, but they're quite negative towards research. And also if you think about it, you know, the problems that we are looking at, if I'm looking at uh, waste management within rural areas, for example, okay, um, to some extent it's not um, my responsibility as a researcher to actually um, contribute something positive to that with the research that I'm doing. Not just take information, take <coughs> People, um, you know, uh, end up being negative to work because what I'm, I'm giving you an hour or 25 minutes of my time. What is it? What, what is an hour? Okay. Um, also, um, something else that I want to say about the um, so, um, but the important part in this way is the framework within you. Uh, in that you do this with him. Okay. That makes sense. Um, okay, I'm going to go on um, with uh, what is research. Now, um, if you think about the comments made yesterday that the devil at one stage had a slide on uh, talking about theory, method, and practice. If you remember that the comments that were made surrounding these different um, aspects and processes and, and things involved in that. Um, he was talking about how research, I mean, how theory is created and, and uh, what theory is at the end of the day. And you were saying, you know, you know that, that thing about uh, sitting under a tree and thinking um, question. Now, you start off with research when you, when you um, start the process of uh, um, and specifically, uh, questioning things, thinking about them, milling them around in your mind, looking at them from different <coughs> angles, um, and then eventually formulating a theory um, regarding that, or a law, or something like that. But there's different things um, that that uh, should be. There's, uh, what's, what's this? there's different requirements that, that should be um, there when we look at research and what constitutes knowledge and those type of things. Okay, so more academically, um, the force in, them, in, in their book talks about scientific research. Um, and they say scientific research is the generation of scientific knowledge as a product of a process. So first of all, there's a process that you go through where the starting point is, is something like, he says, at, um, it's it's the body of propositions, um, factual statements, hypotheses, models, theories, and laws, those type of things, um, that at some specific time is accepted in, in a um, scientific community and becomes part of the body of knowledge uh, created in that study area. So I think um, 
if we do scientific research and if we're generating scientific knowledge, um, at some stage it starts, you are generating knowledge in, in that science. So it starts adding to that specific field of study. But um, an important part of this is the acceptance within the scientific community. People are going to question whatever you research to such an extent, even if you follow the right, the, the right recipe, touching the and the right flavor. Okay. Or a sound flavor, let me say that, it's not necessarily the right one. If you can motivate the soundness of it and the relevance of it, it, it would be right. Okay, so to ensure the, um, this acceptance in the scientific community, um, research methodology, the method of how you do this scientific research is important. Remember I was talking about spectacle dancing um, in the introduction session and I said that you know you see these people dance and you wonder how they do it and you really want to do it yourself, but you won't be able to dance like that if you don't do the classes, if you don't go to classes and someone doesn't <coughs> teach you how to. And someone doesn't show you what is acceptable with being from the ballroom dance. Okay, so um, in terms of what we are then doing in research, research is we're working with knowledge. We're adding to knowledge, we're using knowledge, we're interacting with it the entire time. Okay, so moving on to the nature of knowledge specifically, um, this is a very uh, philosophy perspective that I'm discussing now. Um, I, I did uh, put a link uh, on a fully for you guys in the resource folder of Unit 1 that you can follow um, an academic article written uh, on the nature of knowledge specifically. <coughs> so let me say from the start that there's lots of authors writing about this, number one. What is the nature of knowledge, how it works and how it develops. Um, so I tried to take out the common things within that to discuss with you today, but there's lots of other things as well. So first of all, um, if we talk about epistemology, something that you guys that have done the research <coughs> probably would have come across in the readings that you have done, the term. The term. Um, epistemology is the study of knowledge. So they, they tend to get quite lyrical in terms of how this works and what is known and what is unknown and who can know what. And it's quite interesting to read that. So, um, if we talk about the study of knowledge and what knowledge is, we look at the nature of knowledge. So, what, what is knowledge? Um, we, we ask the questions that, what does it mean to know something or to not know something? If we talk about knowledge. Um, the, and also the extent of human knowledge. How much can I know? And how much um, um, do you actually know about something? Okay. And what is that no aspect? Okay. So um, they theorize or they, they say that there's, there's different types of knowledge. First of all, there's a procedural type of knowledge. <coughs> um, I, I am walking. I know how to walk. It's something that I, that I know. The procedure that I'm going, I know how to ride a bicycle. It's the how-to of something. Okay. So <coughs> the how-to of something is it's the how to of something so it is a procedure that I have the knowledge about. Okay. Um, then there's acquaintance knowledge that we call, um, or they, they call it acquaintance knowledge. This is a, um, a know of. So you've seen the book, you've met him. So you can now say that you know the director of the ACDX. You have knowledge about it. So, yeah. so that is um, acquaintance <coughs> knowledge. Um, also, they also call it familiarity knowledge. So if you are familiar with a specific sub, uh, subject, person, or place, you know what you're doing. Then there's propositional knowledge. Now, propositional knowledge is something that's expressed as a, declar a declarative, declarative statement. So it's, it's a that statement. If I say, if I say that <coughs> um, in the research that in the research that we um, have done, it was found that that is propositional knowledge. <coughs> because I'm expressing a statement, I'm declaring that I have knowledge about a specific statement um, after the process. Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, but propositional knowledge, uh, like I said, is that statement, dogs are mammals. It has been proven that dogs are mammals. Yeah? 
Um, 2 plus 2 equals 7. Something is that. Okay. Um, but note that propositional knowledge can be false or true. 2 plus 2 is not 7. But that is propositional knowledge. Okay. So there's something different that needs to come to the process to actually see if statements are true and if it's knowledge or not. Okay. So, propositional knowledge is the, is the type of knowledge that we, that we mainly work with in scientific research. Uh, it's looking at something, wondering about it, proving that, doing research, doing inquiry, to, to see what the that statement is at the end of the day. Now, there's two different types of them as well, they say. Two, uh, empirical, the term, who has seen the term before. Everybody that's written, that has to do with research methodology, that's written a proposal somewhere. Uh, empirical has always been part of that. So what does that mean? First of all, you get non-empirical knowledge, which is only possible, or which is possible prior to an experience. So for and only relies on reason. So if I have knowledge, if I have non-empirical knowledge about Europe, for example. It's something that I have come to know about you without experiencing it. Okay, does that make sense? So, in that way, it relies only on my mental reasoning. I've never experienced it. When we talk about empirical knowledge as part of propositional knowledge, um, empirical knowledge is only possible after the experience. Okay. So, it is probably... Um, uh, um, um, preceded, it's probably preceded by um, by non-empirical knowledge, as you have come to know. But um, eventually, it becomes empirical knowledge once you've gone through the experience. Now, there's theorists that are discussing these things at length, and some people say that you can only um, have knowledge in terms of it's only a reasoning process. Um, other people say that. The only knowledge that exists is that that you have to experience. So these guys have discussions about these things at home, okay? which is not important for us now. All that you need to know is the two types. <coughs> now, what constitutes knowledge? When, when do you know something? Okay? And there's certain um, requirements that need to be present in terms of this. The um, epistemologist call, call, calls it the justified truth belief. And what that means is it already gives you three things that needs to be um, present for something to be viewed as knowledge. Okay. The first thing is a belief. So a knowledge is a, or a, a, knowledge is a mental state, <coughs> part of it. Okay. It's a mental state, thing that you develop um, in your mind. So if one has no belief about a particular matter, one cannot have knowledge about it. Um, so you first have to decide what you think about something as well before you can generate the knowledge. Does that make sense? So, there's also there's a jury out on this. People, some people say that you don't necessarily have to believe something to interrogate the, the knowledge that surrounds it. So there's also a debate regarding this. But the important thing is there has to be something in your mind that's, that's um, processing and that's working with this thing. And you have to decide what you think about it. So, um, what does this say for you guys in terms of the research process? And why am I blabbing on about this thing? <coughs> um, <coughs> this is where the question comes in. This is where you consider the things that surround you. Okay? So, in that way, you're entertaining an idea or a question. If you're not thinking about it, you don't go over into creating knowledge. Okay? So, it stays a mental process, it goes out of your mind, and then you move on. Um, one example that I was thinking about last night when I went through this presentation is if I heard somewhere someone talking about human trafficking, for example, I cannot then go and say, I heard it, so I have knowledge about uh, human trafficking. Does that make sense? I first have knowledge about human trafficking when I start to think about how does this work? Um, how does, you know, where does it present? Which countries are the most relevant? Blah, blah, blah. When I start to mull over this in my mind, having, creating or developing a belief about this, 
that's when I start with the process of generating the money. Okay. So in that way, um, but now you can see, I'm starting to think about the issue of human trafficking. You can see that there's, the process is pushing. There's something that needs to be done before I can say I have knowledge about human trafficking. It, it should be something that you feel now. <laughs> feel that, no, no, you can't say you have knowledge about human trafficking just because you think you thought about it. It wasn't okay, so the next thing <clears throat> that needs to be present is there needs to be a specific type of truth. <coughs> so once you start developing a belief about something in your mind, you're starting to mull over this, <clears throat> you're starting to think how it works, and you're starting to get interested in, in looking further. Um, we say that a belief does not necessarily constitute knowledge about something. Okay, that's the point that I'm at just now. So we have to hold up the belief against something. And usually what we do is we hold up this belief against what is around us in the world. So the truths that have already been proven. Okay? So what I do now is I want to know more about human trafficking. I start to look around me in the environment and in the world that I'm in. What has been written about this? What has been done about this? I Google a bit. I look at the out there and look further at the references. Um, to see what, what is there, what is there around me regarding this issue. So we hold up the, um, <clears throat> we have to hold it up to something other than the mental state, you cannot just remind, uh, remain <clears throat> as a mental state, and we hold it up against the world around us. So we hold the belief that we are up against the truth that there already exists. Does that make sense? Okay. What does this mean now for your research process? Um, in the research process, we now start to look around us and look at um, what are what are they, what does there exist on the belief that we have developed. Okay, then um, the third thing that we bring into this process. Now we've looked at everything, and now we've we've decided what we believe about it. We've looked at what there is um, around us on the topic, but there's something missing as well. Because I cannot just walk out of my door today and say, well, there's no human trafficking in South Africa. I have a belief. I look at the things around me that's the truth that exists around me. And now I look at the door and say, no, no, there's no human trafficking in South Africa. There's something missing now. If you were standing next to me, you would have said, but how do you know that? Okay. So that's the third part of um, what constitutes knowledge, is the justification part. <coughs> There must exist evidence. So, uh, one of the writers said that only true beliefs arrive at, in the right way, constitute knowledge. <coughs> See where the method comes in again. Um, so, the emphasis here is on the right way. Now, what is the right way? In the different disciplines that we um, work with, in different types of research that you have been in, in contact with and exposed to, why well, do you do the right way? So, um, you could have the belief, it might be true, but you guessed it, for example, that does not, I can, I can not say then that I have knowledge about that. So I cannot say that I have knowledge about human trafficking in South Africa, if I just looked up the door and decided, well, there's no human trafficking in South Africa. Okay. Um, so, what, is, what this means for research is you have to now go and um, investigate it. <coughs> Work with a specific framework to actually support what you find at the end of the day. Um, so, this is what the subject is all about. It's actually just as an introduction <coughs> to what we're going to do the rest of the semester. We want to look at the how, at the justification. So, when you move out with the belief that you have developed, with the truths that you have um, investigated, um, that people cannot uh, say you are just based this research report you reckon just makes okay. So we would like to work with all three of these elements for you to enable you to actually develop knowledge while you're working with these um, themes. So to ensure that you're able to create knowledge about something following the correct guidelines that are acceptable in the scientific community, and that is what we are going to discuss and work with within this module. And of course, there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that you guys have already been expressing that you already know. And you have to bring that to class, otherwise the process is not, um, will not succeed. Because you are also then not bringing some of the justification methods that you use and so on and so on and so on. 
So it's something that we need to discuss in Kelsey's battle, as you know, and leave it open regarding that. Um, and that's my story for today. And I didn't start speaking in gibberish. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the call. <laughs> um, okay, so in our next class, uh, it's next first, uh, Thursday the 13th. Um, and then we, we will be looking at ethics within research. Different types of ethics, like for example, that I spoke about how we go about doing research, how we handle respondents, and also the ethics within creating this knowledge. You know, the, um, ethics within the process of creating it. What's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And up next week, you will exactly know what we find very, very offensive with regard to ethics and research. That's mm -hmm. it. So we'll talk a bit, a bit about that. Any questions you guys have from your side? Um, I'm sorry if this part was a, a, bit, a bit philosophical, but it's necessary for you to know this as well, to know how the process works that we are dealing with uh, in this class. Any questions? So do you know you don't have any questions? <laughs> okay. Okay, so then that's it for, the, for today. Uh, I'm going to do next one's lots of bottle soup. So I finished a bit early, but it's like a view. So we're going to have a good day. With yes. regard to the uh, small mini assignment that we have to do for a uh, disaster and risk um, and climate change, ma'am, I was supposed to work in twos. Are, are you doing it alone and sharing it with someone else? I just quickly want to stop this before it's recording.